You may be seated. All right, all right. I want to welcome those of you that are our guests today, whether you're in the room or you're worshiping online, we're glad to have you. And we'd like to have a record of your visit. And the way to do that, easy, is tap in that number, then the word connect, and give us that little information. And uh, if you have a need or prayer need, tell us that, and we will gladly respond. Members, let's give our guests a hand. Can we do that? All right, today we are going to have this afternoon at 5.30 a little something called Marriage Refresh. We had it last year. And let me say a little word about that. Dottie and I are doing it again this year. You say, why are you doing it again this year? Well, here's why. Last year, Dottie was having knee replacement on the Monday morning after that on Sunday night. And she was in much, much pain 
And uh, she really shouldn't even come to the thing, to tell you the truth, but she did. She did a little bit, not much, and I did basically the whole thing. Now, here's, here's the deal. T tonight, it's going to be very different. I'm going to introduce it, and then she is going to take over, and I need you to be in prayer. There's no telling what she'll do. The only way after I do the introduction that I'll say anything is if she calls on me to say something, I'll respond to that. Or if I raise my hand wanting to say something, but she, she can just say no, and I'll put my hand down. So I am very nervous about this thing this afternoon at 530, but it's going to be fun. About 200 plus people have signed up, 530 in the chapel, and then it's going to, now is Jimmy here? Chris, you're going, you're going to do the, we're having this dessert auction. Yeah, you ought to be the one doing it because you're, it's, your, it's all these students that's going to benefit. Absolutely. Tell us about Absolutely. Hey church, right after the marriage refresh, we have our annual dessert auction where we have students and even some staff and some people who make desserts and we raise money for preteen camp youth camp, junior high camp, high school camp, all of the camps, they're very, very expensive. And so for us to not spread that cost onto families and students, we tried to minimize the cost as much as possible, so we raised funds. And we have a great time. We have some fantastic desserts. It's a live auction, and it's it's a blast. And the cost is $5 if, if you don't go to the marriage refresh. If you go to the marriage refresh, it's free. We're not gonna charge you. But if not, it's five bucks per person to cover the little meal that we're gonna do. It's really, really, it's, it's good. It's gonna be fantastic. But the great parts of the auction. So we would love to have you there tonight in the Grace Center at 6.30, and it runs till about 8, 8.30, is that right? It's until we run out of desserts or everyone runs out of money. Either way, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a fantastic time. Great job, Chris, great job. And Chris, come, not Chris, oh, Rick, I'm calling the wrong name. We have a church in Vancouver that we started supporting before the church ever even existed. That's yes, what we really did. And now it's like about two years, a little over two years old. Two years and old. you all have just come back from a VBS trip. Tell us about it. Yes, sir. The week after, or the Saturday after our uh, spring break here, 17 of us went to Langley, British Columbia, which is right outside of Vancouver. We had 17 ages 18 through 82 went with us. They had 56 children show up for Vacation Bible School. It might not sound a lot compared to what we run, but their church only runs, they only have 60 members of their church. So to have 56 children um, was overwhelming to them. But God blessed in an amazing way. 60% um, of those students or children are not even members of their church. And they saw four decisions for Christ that week. So it was an amazing week. We also went out and just, uh, passed out a, a thousand flyers in the neighborhood to get ready for Easter. And the pastor Christian told me this morning that they had eight brand new families attend for the first time on Easter Sunday. Um, and most of them were not believers as well. So right. they also want to say thank you to First Baptist. They said it over and over again because we have blessed um, your tithes and offerings have blessed in such an amazing way their church. Um, they were able to buy a um, trailer. They are a mobile church. They pack up their church every Sunday, load it into a school, unpack it at the end of the day, take it back and sit at the trailer at the pastor's house. They were having to take two trips before in the pastor's minivan. Um, but now, because of the generosity that we were able to share because of Harvest Day, they were able to purchase that trailer. And now it's one trip. They don't have to unload it into the pastor's garage anymore. And they are extremely thankful for the blessing that First Baptist has been to them and they to us as well. And Sly, now we have a group going back. Sly's taking a group. Yes, Sly's take a, taking a group of our young adults, July 27th through August 3rd. So there's still room available. Um, so if any college students or young adults want to go with that, with well, Sly. Folks, I just thank you for being faithful in your giving. And, and Vancouver's a lot large area, but it's very, very unchurched. It's just almost unbelievable. And that, that church is doing a good, good job reaching people for the first time. So we thank the Lord for that. Now, I think we have some baptisms, do we, Austin? Yes, sir. We do this morning, and we are glad to be in the baptistry. Um, if you're a friend or family member of one that's being baptized, we'd like to ask that you stand in their honor. Uh, this morning with me, I have Allison Herrera. Uh, Allison uh, gave her heart and her life to Jesus a while back, but she is here this morning uh, being baptized, following the Lord in, in baptism and being a great example to her, her family. And so, Allison, it's my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.
Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for loving us. Thank you for saving us. And I pray, Lord, this morning, God, that after somebody here who doesn't know you, God, they would come to know you before leaving this service. God, I'm so thankful for uh, Allison and her decision, God. And I pray, Lord, that, um, God, she would just grow in the faith and mature and, and uh, God, just be more like you every day. Uh, Lord, we thank you and we love you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.
Christ and I say that it is well. from a place of victory. God, you have already won. And we lay claim to that promise and we hold tight to it when we don't understand what's happening in our lives. When it feels like the victory isn't ours, God, may we look to the cross where victory was won once and for all. And may we look to an empty tomb, God, where we lay claim to the promise that that salvation is ours, that resurrection is ours. And Jesus, may we look to the heavens knowing your promise still stands. You are still true to your word. You keep your promises, you will come back again, making all things right. So God, we endure through seasons of hardship and heartache because you are still God and you have already won. Thank you, Jesus, in your name we pray. And the church said, amen. Well, let me add my... 
Let me add my thank you. I'll start all over. <laughs> Let me add my thank you for being here this morning. I want to just say to this sweet family that's come for the baptism, I'm telling you what, that's exactly what families need to do. You've done the right thing this morning, and, and we're proud of you. And I want us just to give them a, a hand again. That's just wonderful. That's just wonderful. You know, we tell, we send a little letter to everybody being baptized. Say, so, you know, like when you have a birthday party, but you, you invite family and friends. And uh, when you get baptized, it, it, it's a spiritual birthday party recognition. And we invite you to do the same thing. So uh, we're always glad we see families here. Well, let me say we've had a great first service. I'm talking to you about something this morning that no matter who you are or where you come from, you are going to be able to relate. And I think what I'll share at the end will be very, very practical. I'm talking to you about being aware of God's presence because sometimes we're not, we're unaware of God's presence. And, and where it really all comes into start is feeling. You know, we all have feelings. We really do. Uh, some days we feel happy. Some days we feel sad. Um, just feeling is a very, very real thing. Sometimes we have feelings that are good. Sometimes we have feelings that are bad. Like I had, I've had two bad feelings this morning. One in the first service, one in this service. In the first service, Jimmy gave me a bad feeling on something he said. And then this service, Chris did the very same thing. And uh, you say, well, what did they say? Well, here's what they said. We're having this marriage refresh. We've got our 200 plus people already signed up to come. Well, what I learned Friday that if they go to that class, they get a free meal ticket tonight. And so all these people are coming to the class to get a free meal. They're not coming to hear me or not. And like when Jimmy said that, I thought, oh my, well, Chris said the same thing. I just had a kind of bad feeling. But, but you know, like in life, all of us from time to time, we have to go to doctors and doctors will do blood work. They'll run tests. Sometimes they do a biopsy. And a few days later, maybe a week later, we get a report back. And if that report is a good report, then we feel good about that. On the other hand, if the report comes back and it's not a good report, we don't have a good feeling at all. And most all of us in the room have had that experience. And if you've not, and you live long enough, you probably will have that experience. So feelings can be kind of an up and down thing. Now, here's what I believe. I believe there's no feeling as bad as being unaware of God's presence. Now, you may not have thought much about that. Maybe you have. But from time to time, I just speak from my own experience. I, I've just been in situations, been doing things, been dealing with things, and I, I, just, I just don't feel like God is present. Now, I know He is. The Bible tells us that God will never leave us. God will never forsake us. Jesus said, I'll be with, uh, with you until the end of the age, the end of the world. So the truth is, like if we're Christians, we have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of us. I understand that. But I must also say that there have been experiences in my life from time to time and oftentimes where I've just not felt God's presence as much as I have felt God's presence at other times. Now, I, I don't think I'm the only person in the room that is like that. I mean, there's sometimes you just feel God is so close that he almost bumps up against you. And there are other times, you, I mean, you, you, you know God's here, all that, but you're just dealing with things and he just does not seem to be ever so close. Well, you know, there's a saying, misery loves company. And I am encouraged when I realize that I sometimes have that experience, that some of God's greatest people, I mean, some of the main event people in the Bible, they had the very same experience. For example, Moses one day turned and saw a bush burning. And at that moment, he was unaware of God's presence at all. It's, it just, I'm always encouraged when I read that story. 
Jacob, you might remember this story, one night was in an all-night wrestling match, and not one time during that wrestling match did he become aware he was in the very presence of God. And, you know, I, I think, well, you know, if, if, if that case, I don't feel so badly. Joshua, the Bible tells us one day that Joshua looked up and saw a sword in a man's hand and thought it was a warrior. What he didn't understand was he was looking and standing in the very presence of God. So, and then Saul on the road to Damascus, when that light shone down at that moment, I don't think Saul had a clue that he was in an unusual presence of God. And so, as I think about those people, I, I don't feel so badly about myself, and I think you're kind of in the same boat. You know, I, I have been a minister 57 years. I've preached, I don't know how many sermons in those many years, but like, there have been times when I have been preaching my sermon that I had prepared it well, what I was preaching would be biblically correct, but I just and sometimes didn't feel I had the presence and anointing of God like other times. You may say, yeah, we heard a lot of those sermons. <laughs> Let me say this to you. Are you ready? It may not have been just me. I may have had God's presence, and you didn't have God's presence. You knew I was coming back, if you, if you know. Okay. Well, it, it works both ways, seriously. I mean, there are just times you just, no matter, you may be going something very difficult, but yet you just feel God's right there to nudge you along and to help you along. Now, you say, well, how in the world would a thing like this happen? Let me tell you the answer. The devil. There is a devil. You know, we don't talk a lot about the devil. We're not trying to lift up the devil. We're trying to lift up Jesus. But having said that, there is a literal, real devil, and he has his angels, and the Bible is very clear about what he seeks to do. In fact, we're going to have a little verse on the screen if you look. Uh, here we go. It says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking for someone to devour. That word devour means literally completely destroy, annihilate. So what I'm saying to you is, you know, we, we're up against one that we sometimes, you know, we say, well, I know there's a devil. We don't think very much about it. In the book of Ephesians, we don't have the verse on the screen, but you might want to just jot the verse down and read it later. In Ephesians chapter number 6, in verse number 12, and I read from the New Living Translation, it says, For we're not fighting against people made of flesh and blood, but against the evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against those who mighty powers of darkness who rule this world, and against wicked spirits in the heavenly realm. So, you know, we're living in a spiritual war zone. And sometimes things just are out there, and I'm not saying everything that happens, the devil did it. I'm not saying that. I would have no way of knowing that. But I am saying this. In my life, I see the devil do numbers of things in real life in very practical ways, and we just have bad feelings about it. You know, I had an experience like that on Friday before Palm Sunday. Friday before Palm Sunday. About 2 o'clock in my office, my study. I was in my back study at church working on Tuesday Bible lunch for the following week. And my cell phone rang, and I answered it, and it was John. And John said to me, Dad, I hate to tell you this, but I cannot preach Sunday. Well, now let me say, I had a double bad feeling. Number one, he told me why. The reason was... John had been dealing with a bacterial infection. We knew that, and we thought at one point he was making progress, but what happened, it kind of went another way, and he got, uh, it went to his vocal cords, and on one vocal cord, he had developed an ulcer, and that finally led to the point that he couldn't even get words out. Now, that Friday before Palm Sunday, he could get the words out, but he certainly couldn't have preached the sermon. Well, it got worse. But 
be that nasty. Now, you say, well, first of all, I had a bad feeling. I hated he, he had the problem. I had another bad feeling. Think about this. Friday afternoon, 2 o'clock, you learn that you need to get up a Palm Sunday sermon by Sunday. I can see you don't care. <laughs> well, if you would have cared if you'd have been the one to do it. You say, well, go pull one of those old sermons off. Well, I've learned this about that. There's not many old sermons I'd ever want to preach again. I thought they were better than they were, but when you look back. But, but really, I said, no, I, I, I want to get up a palm. So, and I'll say this, God, God really helped me during that period. I actually had about nine hours preparation, maybe eight hours on that sermon. But they weren't good hours, like hour here, two hours here, 30 minutes here. It just was a hodgepodge way. But, but I'll tell you what, I had God. And God, oh, and here's good news. Makes me have a good feeling. If all goes well, John will be back preaching, hopefully next Sunday. If not, the following Sunday. Now, you should have a good feeling. You won't have to hear me preach again. You'll have John back. So, you know, these things work all kinds of ways. Well, I, I, there's a devil out there, and he's at work. Now, what I want to show you in the Bible this morning, if you'll open your Bible to Luke chapter number 24, Luke chapter 24, we're going to look at the very familiar story of these two men on that Easter Sunday afternoon, probably late, walking on the road from Jerusalem to Emmaus. You, you're very familiar, hopefully, with the story. If not, we're going to read most of it. This is one of the 10 post-resurrection stories recorded in the Bible. In other words, after Jesus came out of the tomb, the Bible records 10 times that Jesus appeared to people. Now, it was different. He would just come. He'd vanish. He'd walk through walls. He'd walk through doors. Uh, his, his resurrected body was different than his body before the resurrection. But the story on the Emmaus Road is one of those one of those stories. And what's so good about this story, it shows you some very practical ways that the devil can make you unaware of God's presence. See, you can be in church right now this morning and not feel, not, not feel God's presence. You really can. You say, well, I'm here and I'm worshiping God and I've listened to the music, I've sung, and now you're preaching. Yeah, I, we can do all this stuff. But then you can be here some Sundays and you walk out and you just feel like that God was just all over your mind and your being and what was, it was just a great worship experience. Well, that's, that's what I'm talking about. Well, how does the devil keep us from having that experience? Well, I think of it this way. The devil has a toolbox. And in that toolbox, he has tools. And some of those tools would work on all of us. Other tools in his toolbox would be unique. Maybe it would be a tool he would use to make me unaware of God's presence, but it might not be the tool he'd use to make you. Now, the tools we looked this morning are universal. They would be tools that Satan will use in a very practical way to keep you from being aware of God's presence. So let's just look at them. In Luke chapter number 24, Beginning with verse 13, the Bible says, Now behold, two of them, now that's talking about two of the followers of Jesus. These may have been two of the 70 that Jesus sent out, but these are believers. These are followers of Jesus. They were traveling that same day, that's Resurrection Sunday, to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And by the way, it still is seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were restrained, so they did not know him. And Jesus said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are so sad? Now, if you are a Bible underliner, that word sad, we need to underline because that is one of the ways we need to guard against sadness. You know, now from time to time in life, we all experience sadness. We do. Life is not all peaches and cream. Sometimes something will happen. We're sad. Okay. We, that's human. Nothing sinful about being sad. But here's what happens. If Satan finds you sad, he knows you're very vulnerable. You're very vulnerable. Why are you vulnerable? You're sad. 
And when we're sad, here's what we do. We focus on what it is that has made us sad rather than focusing on God, focusing on the things God teaches us in His Word. And the next thing we know, we just have, have just no awareness of God at all. The very, the very time we need the awareness of God most will be the very time we'll have the awareness of God less and it's because we are sad about some situation or we're sad about something. You see, we, we live in a spiritual war zone, and we just have to understand that. Now, these two men, they were sad because they really thought that Jesus was going to be the king that would deliver them from the Roman oppression under which they were living. And now he's dead. When Jesus died, <laughs> in a way, uh, their spirit died. They, they're sad at this point. Now, Satan knows this, and when he catches us in that state. So what we need to know is when we feel sad, we're vulnerable. We're vulnerable. And we need to be on guard not to let that sadness rob us. And so you say, well, what do you do? Well, I'll tell you what you do. During those times you're sad, you just kind of put up the guard and say, okay, I, I, what I'm going to do, I'm going to focus. I'm not going to focus on my sadness. I'm going to focus on God. I'm going to focus on the promises of God that seem to come to my mind. And here's what you'll find. Things will seem different. Now, listen carefully, because they will be different. This is not a mind game. This is not a positive thinking sermon. This is just a biblical truth. If you will focus on what God's Word says when you're sad, there'll be promises you remember you have heard and memorized or read, and you focus on that rather than what it is you're sad about, then you'll just say things seem different. And the reason they seem different, they'll be different. Well, you know, another thing we need to guard against is disappointment. So let's just pick up our reading in verse 19. We'll see it. Then one of those men whose name was Cleopas answered and said to Jesus, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem, and have you not known the things which happened there in these days? Jesus said to them, What things? Well, Jesus knew what things had happened to him. They said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth who was a prophet, mighty indeed, in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priest and the rulers delivered him to be condemned and to death, and they crucified him. Now look in verse 21. But we were hoping, there it is, underline that word hoping. We were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel, that is, set us free from Roman rule and oppression. Indeed, besides all this, and then they begin to carry on a conversation with Jesus. See, when 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 Jesus was when Jesus died, their their hope died, and when hope dies, hope dies when you're disappointed. If you're disappointed, you thought something was going to happen and it did not happen. Well, when that happens, you you're very vulnerable, and Satan knows that. And when he finds you in a spirit of disappointment about something, you are a target to be devoured, to be completely destroyed by the devil. Most of us in the room have had that very experience. Now, there's a difference between disappointment and living in disappointment. We all get disappointed, but we shouldn't all be living in disappointment, but we have too many reasons not to. You know, in the upper room, walking from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus told his disciples, he said, here on earth, uh, you will have many trials and sorrows. So we just need to understand that. In this life, there are going to be things happen that are very disappointing, things we might never have imagined it would happen, okay? But here's what we need to remember. <laughs> Greater is he that is in us than he's in the world. There is a devil, but he's no match for God. Now, the devil will defeat you if you get in a fight, just you and the devil. But we don't have to be in a fight, just us and the devil. We have God and God in us. 
will defeat the devil every time if we will keep our focus on him. So, in our disappointments, if we'll focus on God's presence, things will seem different. Why? Because things will be different. Well, let me show you uh, another thing that uh, we need to be on guard against, and that is we need to be on guard against uh, uh, d disregarding Scripture. Disregarding Scripture. Uh, look with me. Let's pick up down here at about verse 25. Jesus said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. Now look in verse 27. And beginning at Moses, now that'd be the first five books in the Bible, and all the prophets, Jesus expounded, explained to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now understand something. The Jewish people, they knew the scriptures. They knew the scriptures. They just did not know the Christ of the scriptures. Jews today still do not believe Jesus is the Messiah. That's the difference. But they knew their Bible. That's how we would say it. But they did not connect it to what had happened on Resurrection Sunday. So what's Jesus doing? Well, Jesus is explaining to them things from the first five books in the Bible and from the prophets that related to himself. That's new. That was new to them. Now, here's what's interesting. The Bible doesn't tell us what he explained to them. You know what I mean? Like, it just says, look at it again. He expounded to them all the things, the scriptures, the things concerning himself. You say, well, wonder what things he explained. Well, I don't know. But I, I can speculate, perhaps, what Jesus said. He said to them, they would have known the story. He said, you remember the story about Abraham taking and offering Isaac, his son? Now, they would have known that story. And he said, yet God spared Isaac. But he said, hey, guys, listen, God didn't spare his own son. I'm his son. God didn't spare me. I'm the one who died on the cross. I'm the one who shed blood. And it began to all make sense to them. You say, well, what, you know, what else might he have explained? I don't know, but I can't believe he wouldn't have explained about the Passover. You, you're, you know, they would have known about the Passover, Exodus chapter 12. I, I think Jesus might have said, guys, you remember, you read in the Bible where the, the people of God, the Jewish people, they put blood on the door post and the lintel. And when the death angel came through, he passed over. And none of those firstborn were killed, but the blood won. Y'all remember that story? Oh, yeah, yeah. Maybe Jesus said, okay, now what you need to understand is, I'm the Passover lamb. I'm the Passover lamb. Maybe, that, maybe that's what he explained. Or maybe, maybe he just took some of the major prophetic text from the prophets that pertain to the crucifixion and said, look, you guys have read this. I want you to understand, I'm the one who was crucified. So I don't know what all Jesus explained. I just know what the Bible says. He expounded them in all the things concerning the Scripture. And to me, that's very, very significant. Now, let me say this. It prepares us for what was about to happen. Look with me in verse 28. Now, after he did that, in verse 28, it says, Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. He was going to go on. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it's toward evening, and the day is far spent. And Jesus went in to stay with them, and it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and gave it to them. The Bible says, Then their eyes were open, and they knew him. And then Jesus vanished from their sight. And then they said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the Scriptures to us? So they rose up early that very hour, returned to Jerusalem, found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together. And here's what they said, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Now, let me stop a moment and say, we have no record 
of what conversation took place between Jesus and Simon Peter. If you want a verse in the Bible, you remember Peter denied Christ three times, okay? Well, in John chapter 21, Jesus gave Peter a second chance. He put him back in the ministry. So somewhere between denying Jesus three times in John 21, Peter had to have repented of what he did. This would be the only verse in the Bible that I'm aware that it may be where that happened. Why did he just go to Peter? Well, I, I, I think here's where Peter repented of what he had done. But anyway, and they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Now, here's the point. I think when Jesus explained the scripture to them, it opened their eyes and prepared them for what they were about to experience at this meal time. When they saw him break the bread and they saw his hands, I, I think had Jesus not explained the scriptures to them, that very same things, those things would have happened, but they would, they would have missed it. They would never have been aware. You see, when we disregard scripture, you say, how do you disregard Scripture? <laughs> One way is don't read it. I disregard it. Another way, you, you just read it and don't apply it. You just study it. You become a Bible scholar, but you don't, you don't do what it says. You don't appropriate it in your own life. Well, what good is that? Well, one of the great things the Bible does, as you read the Bible, it's amazing how you read something today I've had this happen in this times. I read something today in my Bible reading plan. And maybe that day, I, I don't see anything that day for me for that day. But lo and behold, down the way here, I find myself in a situation. And then I, I go by and say, hey, I read about that. The Bible prepares you for things not only for today, but for what's down the road. But I'll tell you what else the Bible does. It it. It blesses you and helps you by reminding you of things gone by. Now, I had this happen last week. Last week, one of my chapters to read was Exodus chapter 12, the Passover. Well, I read it. I love that chapter. I love that story. But I noticed in my Bible that in the margin, I had written some stuff. And I had to turn my Bible sideways. Now, it's not this Bible. It's the Bible I use in my brain. To read what I was just curious what I'd written. And what I had written was, I had written the date. It was in March. I don't remember the exact date off the top of my head. Now, March 2022, I remember that. Then I had dash. I had Dr. Rodriguez, dash, phone call, all good. Now, that wouldn't mean anything to you. But it meant a great deal to me. Because on that date... In 2022, I had read Exodus chapter 12. And on that date, Dottie's cancer doctor called her to say, okay, now you started your chemo in 2019. That's 2022. Every few months, you go take all these tests, etc." And that day was a phone call to say, okay, got your scans back. Got all your blood work back. Everything's okay. See you in six months. So I had written that in the margin of my Bible. And it, it just blessed me to be reminded of what? That the same God who was with us back in March 2022 is the same God that's with us right now and the same God that'll be with us whatever we face. And folks, it's not just us, it's you too. Could I have an amen? I'm telling you, it's amazing. I encourage you, don't disregard Scripture. It will help you in ways absolutely unbelievable. Now, I want you to think about, I want to, I want to give you something so when you walk out of here, you, you know how to do what I've been talking about this morning. Like the question is, what can you do each day to have an awareness of God's presence? I think that's a fair question. It's a good question. When you come in here and hear me talk about the awareness of God's presence, not being unaware of God's presence, okay, fine. Now, the point, if I were you, I'd say, well, I hope preacher's going to tell me how to do that. Well, I am. I'm going to give you the answer right now. 
And it's going to stay on the screen long enough for you to write it down. I hope you will. Here's what you do. You do each day in this life what you will do in eternity. That's the answer. That's, a, that's worth coming to church for. If we, if we took up offerings, I think we'd just take up another offering on that right now. You just do what you do each day that you would do in eternity. You say, what do we do in eternity? I'll tell you what we do in eternity. In eternity, we adore God. We praise God. We sing praises to God. We just, I just think in eternity, we'll just want to keep our eyes on Jesus, wherever Jesus goes. I, I mean, I've, I've, I don't know how it is there altogether, obviously, nor do you. But we do know this, Jesus will be there. So what are we going to do in eternity? We're going to adore him. That's what we're going to do in eternity. So you do each day now what you will do in eternity. You sing praises to God. That's what we'll do in heaven. Sing praises to God here. You don't have to sing them out loud if you choose not, but just in your heart, sing praises to God. You know, it's just, it's just a, you see, in eternity, think of this, we will be where God is, okay? Until you get where God is, get God where you are. And that's how you do it. And I encourage you. I, I just, I really do. If you're this this week, think about, okay, now when I get to heaven, what am I going to be doing in heaven? You're going to be singing praises to God. You're going to be worshiping God. You're going to be adoring God. Okay, but I'm not in heaven. I'm down here. So how is it down here? Well, I'm in a hurry to this. I'm in a hurry to that. I'm rushing over here. I got to get this done. I mean, it, it's just like a rat race. It's like a rat race. But somewhere in this rat race, what we've got to do is do here what we're going to be doing there. And I tell you what, you'll experience an awareness of God like absolutely unbelievable. Well, I want you to bow with me this morning. You know, as I think about what I've shared with you, the key to that, though, is you've got to be sure you're going to be in eternity, in heaven. Now, you're going to be in eternity, but it could not be heaven. You could be that your eternity will be in hell. There are just two possibilities, heaven or hell. And I want you to know, and I would think you want to know, no, my eternity is going to be in heaven with God. And know the reason. And the reason is because there's been a time in your life where you've realized you were a sinner and you have repented of your sins. You have asked Jesus to come into your heart, make you a Christian, and then hear this, and you've trusted him alone for the forgiveness of your sins. Not your church, not your baptism, not your Lord's Supper, not any of that, not your good works, none of that. We need to do all of that, but that's not how we become a believer. That's not how we go to heaven. Jesus said, I'm the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. And Lord, I feel in this room today, and perhaps watching today, there are those that would say, I'm not 100% sure when I die, I'm going to heaven. I'm 90% sure. I'm 95, 98. I'm 80, 70, whatever. But God, we can't, we can't hope on this because when eternity time comes, it's over. But then it's forever. And God, we want that forever to be with you. I'm praying this morning, God, that the Holy Spirit will clarify in the hearts of each person here that needs to settle their salvation to know that when they breathe their last breath here, they breathe their first breath with you in heaven. I pray this morning, God, those decisions will be made. Now, with our heads bowed, if you say, well, Pastor, I, I know I need to make that decision. I've been thinking about it. And I know I do. You might say, well, Pastor, I'll be honest, I hadn't really been thinking about it till today, but I'm thinking about it right now. Well, the devil didn't get you thinking about it. God did. Or you may say, you know, Pastor, to tell you the truth, 
I think about this a lot. Then I'll not think about it. Then I'll think about it a lot more. I'm just not sure. Whichever of those groups might be you, pray this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, maybe I've already trusted you, maybe not. But I, I've just got to get this settled. I'm asking you today, God, if I've never, I do now. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. Make me a Christian. I trust you, Jesus, alone for my salvation. In your name, I pray. Head still bowed. Now, in a moment, I'm going to encourage those of you that have prayed that prayer, whether it be today or previous, but you've never made your public stand, your public profession. Jesus said, if we confess him before men, he will confess us before the Father who is in heaven. Now, we, we do that here. We just give people opportunity to stand. God's people are praying. They just stand. And their standing is their profession. And God in heaven looks and sees and knows. And I'm telling you, if you're one of those today that needs to make your public stand, you'll leave this room today with a joy and a peace that you've never experienced in all of your life. So while we pray, I'm just going to wait here a moment and say, if you today need to be the one to stand, it takes courage to do it. Just stand up right now and remain standing. I want to have a prayer over you. We'll just wait and see. In the first service, I think we had four, maybe five. What about this, sir? Who today would say, I've, I've trusted Jesus, but I've never made my public profession of faith? Who will stand first? If you're watching, you can stand right where you are. Two right there. All right. Who else will stand? Just remain standing. I want to pray over you. Any others? We're not trying to count numbers. We're trying to just say, hey, we just want every soul to be right with God. We're trying to help people do that, encourage people. Anybody else? Well, Father, you see these two, and you see those that may have stood that are watching. God, I just ask you to bless them. I ask you to fill them with your spirit, God. I pray that every day they'll know you better and love you more. And I thank you today, God. Even though we know you are always with us, I thank you that when we have those feelings that we just unaware of your being with us, that we will remember some things we've looked this morning that might be the cause. It might be other things. Satan has a big old toolbox. He has a lot of tools because we are all different. But God, thank you that we don't live by feeling. We live by faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give God glory for that. All right. Now, for those who stood... We encourage you when you leave, if you would, uh, we're getting out on good time. I want to encourage you to go down, right at, go out in the commons, just go around the curve there, and you'll be at the family. We want to give you a Bible. It's just like this Bible, exactly. And we want to pray with you. And then if you're here today and you say, well, you know, I want to talk to a minister about my soul, go to the family room. If you, they say, I would like to join this church. I'm already a Christian. But I would like to join this church. This go down to the family room. Now, I'm going to be in the family room. And those that stood, I sure would love to have the opportunity to speak to you. And then if others are here, I'll be there as well to speak to you. So we're going to stand. Chris, what are you going to tell us? Amen. As, you're, as we're about to head out to leave, I want to remind you about our marriage refresh tonight. 5.30, please. Couples, come on out. It's going to be great. And then our dessert auction immediately to follow at 6.30. Amen. Church, we have a tremendous purpose and mission. We all say it together. Are you ready? What is it? Our mission is to help in Jesus Christ. Amen.